Hello, everyone. Welcome, and thanks for being here today. Uh, my name is Jessica, and I've been the person who's been emailing you with details about this workshop. I'm going to be facilitating the Q&A portions of the workshop today. So just a quick overview of how that's going to work. In the toolbar at the bottom of your screen, you should see three options. There's Q&A, raise hand, and chat. If you're experiencing any technical issues, problems with audio, or something of that nature, please direct those questions to that chat feature and we'll assist you. We're not gonna be using the raise hand feature for this meeting, so you can disregard that. Um, we will have Q&A breaks paced throughout Najiha's presentation. So while Najiha is presenting, you're welcome to submit questions related to the section that she's covering using this Q&A button. We won't be able to fully answer all your questions, but we will do our best to kind of pick out the questions that are arising most frequently for Najiha to address live during those um, Q&A sections. So this is kind of a brief overview of our agenda for the day. We're almost done with my intro and then we'll briefly cover programs from the San Mateo County Office of Sustainability. That's the entity that's funding this workshop today. And then we'll jump into the wonderful world of composting. So Najiha will start with an overview of the Compost Hub program, and then she'll provide a lecture overview of backyard hot pile composting how-tos. And then she'll head out into her garden for a live compost demonstration. And then we'll kind of wrap up with an ending poll and some ending thoughts. So with that, I will hand it over to Ivana to cover some information about Office of Sustainability programs. Great, thanks, uh, Jessica, and good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here on this beautiful Saturday morning. Uh, we had a last minute change to the agenda, so you'll also be hearing from uh, my colleague, Krista, about compost rebates um, in a minute. So I just want to uh, give a little bit more background about where this workshop is coming from. Uh, as Jessica mentioned, I work for the Office of Sustainability, as does Krista, and the Office of Sustainability does a number of things, which I'll tell you a little bit about. Um, but our mission is to build a sustainable community that fulfills the needs of the present and the future. And so part of that is uh, raising awareness about uh, better ways to steward our natural resources and uh, develop better practices for the kinds of waste that we produce. So just a quick overview on some of the departments of our office. We, um, we have program areas in a number of different areas. Uh, sorry to be redundant there, but we, I won't go into much detail on these, but we have uh, programs in uh, developing uh, support and political uh, support for affordable housing options throughout the county. We have an active transportation program that actually has an active transportation plan for the county that's open right now for uh, your input and feedback. So if, you, if you're interested in that, uh, check that out. We also have a whole program area on climate uh, emissions, uh, reductions and adaptation planning for the green business program. And then a whole suite of resources and programs around saving energy and water and uh, re improving your uh, pr practices at home around waste. So we have school programs, we have resources to help families and multifamily dwellings in improve their, uh, their solid waste practices, how they recycle, how they compost, et cetera. So if you have any questions about that, we, the, our, off, our office offers a wealth of uh, programs and resources. So I encourage you to check out our website. So the specific program that is bringing you this workshop is called the Sustainability Academy. And the goals of this program are to provide free education to, rise, to raise awareness about complex social and environmental issues, to empower residents to take agency in their lives and build community leadership through experiential education. So part of the experiential education is different now that we're in COVID, um, but we are still doing what we can. And I think today is going to be a treat uh, because we get to kind of simulate the best we can being in an actual garden in East Palo Alto. So just to give you a little rundown of what the Sustainability Academy offers, we have offered in the past and will offer again a master composter class that took a bit of a hiatus this year because of COVID. It's historically been a very hands-on class. 
And uh, we just didn't have the capacity to totally rework that class this year. So we'll offer it again in 2021. We offer a master in local sustainability class that covers a range of topics, uh, including local agriculture and food systems and climate change and sea level rise. We have home composting workshop series like this one, edible home gardening workshop series that's ongoing. And we're gonna offer another session on that soon. We'll be offering a local environmental justice panel sometime this fall, TBD. And we also provide connections with remote and distance in-person volunteer opportunities. Some of the people behind the team are myself, Camille, Jesus, Todd, uh, Jeannie, Joe, and Jess. And the person you're about to hear from also, uh, we should put her on here as well, Krista is our resident composting guru and just reuse guru. She is the uh, sort of whiz behind the hotline. Um, so I'll just pass it off to her for a second, for a few minutes to talk about composting discounts that, are, uh, that our office offers. Oh, so after attending this workshop, if you are a San Mateo County resident, you are able to get one of these bins. So the one on the left is a soil saver and you can get a base with it and it's a $138 value or you can pay $40 and get the tumbler on the right. And they both have different purposes. So if you have any questions after this, you can feel free to call the hotline and I'd be happy to talk you through the differences. Next slide, please. And you can also get a $15 discount towards accessories. So there's the nice stainless steel kitchen pail that you can get, or there's the compost aerator. Next slide. And a couple years ago, we added where you can get a $200 rebate for building your own because you might have your own bin design that you really like, but we do have a couple of bin designs up on our website for each of these bins. The one on the top is a stackable one, so you can unstack it and restack it. And the one on the bottom is a three bin system. And I believe that's what Najiha has. And so um, you would just buy the materials and keep your receipts and then turn in the receipts and then we will give you a rebate. And those instructions are on our website, so you can find more at sustainability.org slash composting. And that's about it. And if you have any questions about any of these, you can always give us a call or send us an email. And we'd be happy to talk you through it. It's just best to know what you want before you call Triformis. And uh, we'll be sending you a link to Triformis. That's where you would get the soil saver or the tumbler. Thank you. Great, so I haven't seen any questions come in, so I think we'll um, roll into introducing Najiha. Great. So today we uh, get to hear from Najiha Alasmar. She's an education program specialist here in East Palo Alto, and she dedicates her time to local projects in East Palo Alto, including the Collective Roots Garden and Taking Root Urban Agriculture Youth Leadership Pilot which I would love to know more about, as well as South Bay Veggie RX nutrition education class, classes. She works to make these things more affordable and accessible, uh, to find resources to learn how to grow and share locally grown organic produce through building gardens, maintaining garden resources, and facilitating nutrition and gardening workshops. Najiha grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area and graduated from the University of California, Irvine in, in 2012. Uh, with a degree in psychology and social behavior and followed by a master's degree in integrated eco-social design. That sounds really interesting. From Gaia University International. She has interned for various organizations that focus on social justice and nature preservation, such as Irvine Ranch Conservancy, Actera, Hidden Villa, and the Pachamama Alliance. Her work as a health promoter for the nonprofit in Nuestra Casa in East Palo Alto sparked a passion for building community in underserved communities. She loves the outdoors, growing organic produce and cooking, and she has a real talent for engaging diverse audiences on all these topics, I can attest. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Najiha. Thanks, Najiha. Thank you, Ivana, for that introduction and all of the other amazing programs that the Office of Sustainability does. Um, 
I want to have an, another form of gratitude for y'all because, um, you know, we have a grant through you guys. So <laughs> I'm doing what I'm doing because, um, you know, y'all are helping us and, and enabling us to do that. So thank you again. Uh, yeah, so I'm so happy to be here. It's a real pleasure for me to be here. Uh, the more people are doing this, uh, the more we're helping the planet become better, healthier, happier. Um, and uh, before I get into our program, I really wanna just kind of settle in, do a brief grounding meditation, um, just so that we can kind of, you know, focus a little bit more and hopefully set maybe an intention for today's workshop. So if y'all want to just kind of sit or stand, whatever's comfortable for you, close your eyes, or you can just have a soft gaze. That's perfectly fine. And go ahead and just maybe put your hands on your laps or to the sides of you, kind of shake it off a little bit, and then take a deep breath in through your nose all the way down to your belly and hold it there for a few seconds and then release slowly through your mouth. I'm going to do this just a few times. So again, breathing in for a few seconds, holding it and breathing out slowly. Do this again. Just all the way down to your di diaphragm. And if you want, you can put your hand on your chest and feel the air coming into your lungs, through your chest, or if, you, if it feels comfortable on your belly, you can feel the air that way. Just feeling the air going into our system. And maybe put your attention on your feet. Um, Know that your feet are anchored to the floor or the ground, and that ground absorbs the energy that you put into it through your feet. And there's energy in the ground through that, and that connection to the ground that we all have, and the connection that we have to all living beings on this earth. And sitting with that connection, letting those energetic roots symbiotically come in and out of you within the ground and the space. Just bringing our awareness to this. Take a couple more deep breaths. And as you're breathing, maybe set an intention for this workshop. Maybe it's learning about the system of composting. Maybe it's asking a question that you've had. Maybe it's just listening. Hmm. When you're ready, go ahead and open your eyes. And come back to this space. I hope y'all feel a little bit more grounded and settled in. Have your intention in mind as we start to learn about composting, which is super exciting. Um, next slide, if you will. So as they mentioned, uh, I work for a nonprofit here in Palo Alto called Fresh Approach. And our intention is to bring healthy food access to people in the Bay Area. We do reach people in the South Bay, uh, as well as the East Bay, including different routes here in uh, East Palo Alto and the Greater Bay Area. And we do that through three main programs. Uh, I mentioned some of them already. It's our gardening program, which is essentially uh, a community gardening network uh, where we host monthly workshops. They used to be in person here at the Collective Roots Community Garden, and now uh, we're doing virtual, so that's pretty exciting, uh, which in this program, uh, it's a network. So we do a variety of things, including seed swaps, which essentially <laughs> we're doing mailing now, lots of mailing of seeds. You're welcome to come to the, the main community garden here and pick up seeds as well. Um, and I can gather those for you or mail them to you. 
We also have other resources like compost and soil, mulch, um, all sorts of resources just to get you set up. Uh, we also have assistance in becoming a certified producer for our mobile farmer's markets, which I'll talk about in just a second. Um, and we also do home garden installations for quali qualifying participants. So essentially um, uh, underserved communities or low income folks who uh, have space at home, but just don't have the capacity to, to build their own beds. Um, we, we offer that service to y'all. Uh, and then our other programs are our farmer's markets. Uh, we have an East Palo Alto farmer's market that is on Wednesdays. Um, it's going to come to an end November 18th, but I can send you all some more information on that after the workshop. Uh, and we also have our mobile farmer's markets, which are different <laughs> routes that we go along in this little taco truck looking thing. Um, and we offer farmer's market or farmer's market produce on those mobile markets. So we have some routes in the East Bay and the South Bay. Um, and again, I can, I can forward you some information on that at post workshop. And then last but not least is our nutrition program, which we call Veg, Veggie RX. So essentially, uh, we learn um, not only, you know, what nutrition is, why it's so important, but we also learn about um, behavior change and why that's so important. So we kind of support you in that whole process of setting SMART goals uh, that are very intentional and manageable. Um, and then uh, throughout an eight week um, course, uh, we guide you in becoming uh, hopefully healthier and happier um, consumers of, of the earth. So uh, those are our main programs. Um, and in conjunction with that, we have our youth leadership program, which essentially uh, we have youth uh, between 14 to 18 year olds uh, take our course. I think we're going to make it virtual, so stay tuned for that, um, in which we teach uh, the youth, you know, the importance of urban agriculture, the current food systems that we have now, and as well as uh, urban agriculture and, and um, different workshops like these, where we teach them about the importance of composting and soil management and um, edible gardens, but also, uh, you know, a lot of different things with our food system. And then... Yeah, those are our main programs. Um, so next slide, please. And in conjunction with that is our, our new, one of our newer programs, our compost hub, which essentially bridges the gap between our farmers markets and other community members and our community uh, garden here. Uh, essentially, we started this program last year when we received our four R's grant from the Office of Sustainability in San Mateo County. Uh, and we did this so that we could tackle this big issue that we have with uh, reducing food waste. Uh, we also wanted to relocalize our community-based compost, uh, improve soil quality and structure for better land stewardship and preservation. And ultimately, uh, a lot of uh, the main goal of our programs is to build community and uh, encourage people to, to be empowered to take proactive um, ownership over their land. And so this program, um, it's, it's an invitation for community members to donate their food scraps in exchange for more buying power at our farmer's market and growing power for the compost that's made. Uh, it's a great option for those of you who want to contribute to creating a compost, um, but don't have a space or capacity to, to make it at home. So for those of you who live in San Mateo County, if you are interested in joining this compost program, um, you are able to do so. And I could show you um, how to do post workshop as well. So next slide. So diving a little deeper, why is it important to reduce food, food waste? Uh, essentially, hundreds of thousands of tons of food is wasted every day in the United States. When broken down, this is roughly one pound of food wasted per person each day. And this food rots in the landfill and releases methane, a potent greenhouse gas. And on top of the climate impacts of growing landfills, there is also the environmental impacts of the energy and resources that went into producing that food in the first place. So putting this into perspective, 53% of all food waste actually comes from individual households. So reducing household food waste is super important to reducing greenhouse gas emissions and slowing climate change. Next slide. So in this compost hub, 
right? We are having a, we essentially have a model of a closed loop system, um, which in which participates Participants purchase fresh produce from our local farmer's market, and then they use it in their meals, and then they collect those food scraps, you know, uh, we'll talk about, you know, different things like uh, apple cores and um, beet socks and things like that. So they collect all of these in their buckets, their receptacles, and then they bring it, they bring these food scraps back to us, uh, and we collect it, and then we integrate it into our compost system. Uh, here at the garden, and then uh, we turn that into rich, nutritious compost to be used in other community gardens, or what we do is we'll, we'll take these buckets back, and then folks who have donated food scraps are actually able to take fresh compost home as well. So it's a, it's a closed loop system where we're trying to minimize as much waste as possible and get fresh compost out to the community as much as possible. So how the program works. So essentially, we um, go ahead uh, for the next slide. How it works, uh, we promote. So we recruit participants, uh, uh, mainly from the East Palo Alto community, but anyone from San Mateo County is welcome to join. Uh, and uh, we do this through online promotion, through our nutrition workshops and other events like this one, flyers, word of mouth, and uh, our farmer's markets as well. So as soon as we recruit somebody, we let them know, hey, uh, before we can have you sign up with us, uh, they have to take a workshop. And it used to be a live workshop, and now we created a video. So it's super easy. It's on YouTube. Uh, they essentially, you learn about all about the program logistics, like we are now, uh, why composting is important. And at the very end, we ask folks to go uh, in the description of the video, there's a link to a survey, and they take the survey, and at the very end, there's a contract, uh, which kind of just uh, shows accountability for what we expect from, from the food donations. And then after that, you come over and you pick up your bucket and you can start collecting food scraps right away. Uh, so yeah, so now uh, with COVID, we've adapted this to a YouTube video, so it makes it a lot easier. And we, I think we have about 55 people signed up right now and we get about 30 buckets a week on average so it's pretty nice uh so we have new members and then we have pickups and drop-offs um and we want to do it weekly just so that <laughs> the contents don't get too sludgy or too uh you know moldy that sort of thing we want you know fresher items so whenever we get these food scraps we definitely do a quality check to ensure that we're getting the, the materials that we want to integrate into our system. And after that, uh, after this quality check, we, we, made, we weigh the materials just so that we can determine the amount of food that we're diverting from landfills. It's not really so much, you know, the more you bring us, the more, uh, you know, incentive we'll give you. It's more about, you know, kind of putting into perspective what we're doing with this system and how it's benefiting um, everybody. So the bucket is collected and the member receives $4 in vouchers to spend at our farmer's market. So these vouchers are good at different partner farmer's markets that we have. So we can give you a booklet uh, to let you know where you can use those vouchers. But if you're already at our farmer's market, usually people just get their, get their vouchers and spend them right then and there. And they also have the option, like I said before, of taking home uh, either an empty bucket to, to keep bringing back the donations or they can bring back uh, take a clean bucket filled with fresh compost that we that we bring from the compost uh, from the community garden that morning to add to their gardens at home. And like I said, uh, we take those food scraps, uh, we integrate it into our system at the Collective Roots Community Garden. And like uh, what was said before, uh, we have a three bin hot pile composting systems. We actually have two of those where we maintain the piles. Uh, and then we sift them, and then we have our finished product to be distributed out to the community. And like I said, these are the ones that we're going to be talking about today, but we have other examples as well. So if you're interested in becoming a Compost Hub member, I'm happy to send along the link uh, for the video for you to sign up. And uh, ultimately, we're currently working with other partners in East Palo Alto in order to expand this Compost Hub program and include more community Compost Hub sites. So if you're even interested in just having your own community compost hub site, uh, we actually created a video on how to, um, we had a best practices guide for how to create your own compost hub. 
Uh, and we also have a best compost uh, hub practices guide for you to look at. So if you want to create your own, uh, we can support you in that way. And any technical assistance as well. So if you really want to get this going, you can contact me and we can definitely support you in that process. So after that, that was a lot of information. Um, do we have any questions? Hello. <laughs> we had a couple questions about how to join and um, where the garden is and how to participate. But I, I do think that's something you'll be following up with links on after the workshop and you also discussed that a bit as you we were going. Let me just make sure Absolutely. nothing came in in the chat. No, nothing else in the chat. So um, those were all of the questions, but there does seem to be some interest in joining. So that's awesome Yay. to see. Super cool. Yeah, yeah. So this is really just like a, a way for you to engage with the community, give back to the community, but also, you know, just, you know, spread composting, right? Um, so uh, if there are no other questions, we can get right into the topic of today. So in hot pile composting, we're taking our food scraps and yard remains and converting them into nutritious compost to add organic matter into our gardens, right? And organic matter is important uh, for adding nutrients to our soil, but also improving the soil structure as well. So a lot of the times gardeners are like, what's my soil like, right? So you got to really examine it, right? And, you know, different parts of your garden are going to have different consistencies of soil aggregates and soil um, components. So adding organic matter, adding compost is just a really organic way and wonderful way to improve that soil structure and give nutrients back to your plants um, in the most natural way possible, honestly. Uh, so like I said, for our system, we chose a three bin system. Uh, you can also do single piles if you have a smaller space at home. Um, as you can see, you can make your pile out of many types of materials. Like in this picture, there's a wood material, uh, a wood bin, uh, different types of wood pallets or plastic, or uh, in this example here, number two, plastic bin, there's a bio stack, um, or number four, there's a tumbler, and we'll talk a little bit about those when we go outside a little bit. Or you can simply just dig a trench in your backyard. Like you don't even need an actual bin or receptacle as long as you have something to hold these materials so that those different, um, you know, decomposers could get in there. And we'll talk about that in just a second. But essentially your receptacle has to be about three feet cubed, meaning three feet wide, three feet long and three feet high. That is the, the sweet spot to get, to, to get your pile at the optimal temperature, which is right between 100 to 150 degrees. Uh, this is so that those critters can live healthy and happy in that in that space so they can create the compost that we want. Um, and so if you are going to create the bin system like we have, uh, which is in the top right corner sort of, and uh, where it's like three stages, um, you're going to need about 10 feet long by four feet wide, four feet high. Just that extra foot gives you elbow room to like move the components around and and do what you need to do. And obviously you can extend those systems as well. If you have one, one pile, you can create another pile and extend it uh, depending on the capacity of your space. Um, yeah, and you can build smaller systems as well. And for those of you who like really have like no room, uh, another viable option is a vermicomposting system or a small worm bin in your apartment um, or your space. And there is a really cool workshop that happened, I think, last month, all about vermicomposting. So if you want to get on that, definitely ask Jessica about that. And uh, this graphic here on the bottom was actually taken from this really cool infographic that we got from the Office of Sustainability on the, the, different, method, uh, the different cycles of how to create your hot, hot composting pile. Next slide. So like I talked about before, um, the little guys that create our compost. So who makes our compost, right? Uh, super easy, little uh, abbreviation, the FBI, which stands for fungi, bacteria, invertebrae. So all of these guys here are super critical uh, components to creating our compost. 
So essentially they eat it, they break it down, um, and they poop it out, and that's what gives us our, our castings and our compost. So by living in it, essentially they create this stuff for us. And all they really need, just like us, they just need food, water, air, and shelter. So they're very similar <laughs> in that way. Um, but they're super essential, right? Uh, without them, we wouldn't have this. And compost, right? Um, this happens natural in, in the forest that we live in, right? So every time a, a tree, a deciduous tree is shaking off their leaves, right? Uh, those leaves are essentially the, the ground cover and the compost and all those critters that are living underneath the soil are breaking that down so that the nutrients um, of that tree uh, are getting absorbed from those castings, from, from, from the decomposers doing their job, and then it gets reabsorbed into the tree. So that closed loop system just naturally happens out in the real world as well. So we're literally just recreating sort of that natural process when we're composting. And what we're doing is creating like a compost hotel for these guys to live in. And we'll just talk about that right now. So next slide. So what materials do we need to create our hot pile? So um, you'll, you'll know how much material you need depending on your materials use. So different materials have different uh, absorbency consistencies, but essentially you really want just a combination of carbon, which is brown materials like cardboard, straw, mulch, or wood chips, dried leaves, that sort of thing, and then nitrogen. Uh, this is our green material, mainly food scraps, washed out eggshells, weeds without seeds. We don't want to, <laughs> we want to avoid uh, the weeds spreading as much as possible. So we want to get them before they go to seed. Uh, cleaning up annuals. So, you know, our, our, um, our different annuals that we had in the spring and summertime from the year, uh, hopefully they're not diseased. <laughs> we don't want to spread disease. So if they are diseased, just um, we could throw that in our municipal compost bins because their systems are a lot higher temperature and they're able to process that a lot better than, than a garden compost can. And uh, other things like coffee grinds, uh, grounds and tea bags. Um, make sure your tea bags are plastic free. There are tea bags that do have nylon, so just be sure that it's not, not plastic. Or if it is plastic, I've had, I've had those in my compost pile and I try to just snag them out. Um, as soon as I see them, you know, it's not, it's not perfect. It's not bulletproof, it's not foolproof. So just be mindful of that. Um, and then we want to create uh, these three inch layers um, of these two recipe ingredients at a three to one ratio of carbon to nitrogen. And it doesn't have to be perfect. Uh, you kind of just have to kind of work with the pile and see what works and what doesn't. Like I said, they have different absorbency levels, like cardboard has different absorbency, letter, uh, absorbency levels compared to like mulch and same with straw, that sort of thing. So you kind of have to work with it and see what works. And then let's move on to the next slide. So we know what we want to put in our, in our compost pile, but we just want to be mindful of what we don't want to put in our hot piles. Um, because these items will, will not decompose properly. Uh, they might introduce different pests that we don't want. Uh, and some are just not suitable for, you know, our decomposers to break down. So these are things like plastic, metal. This includes like those stickers on our, on our apples and our pears and the like. Uh, so try to peel off those stickers before you throw those into your, into your, or into your compost bins. We don't want any meat, dairy, or bones. Again, our piles are not hot enough to kind of break these down uh, at, at, at optimal temperature to, to mitigate these sort of items. Uh, but the municipal compost, the city compost, is able to, to process these because there's work at a higher temperature. And we also don't want to introduce different pests. This is an easy way for raccoons and rats to get in our compost when we have like different things that are uh, that are just what they like to eat, like dairy and meat products, right? So we just want to be mindful of that. Same thing goes with bread, cereals, and the like. They, you know, rats love that stuff, raccoons love that stuff. So we just don't want to throw those in so that they don't, go, they don't, you know, introduce that to them. And we don't want too much citrus or onions. Um, onions are antibacterial. 
Uh, bacterial is important for the compost, especially good bacteria. So minimize onions. It's okay if it's a little bit, but we just don't want like a huge bag of onions in there. Same with citrus, not too much citrus because it does make the soil or the compost slightly acidic if you have a lot of it. Um, but you know, a little bit here and there isn't too bad. And I mentioned this before, disease plants, uh, avoid that just so that we don't spread diseases in our soil. Weeds with seeds, we can uh, be observant in our gardens and make sure we, we get the weeds before they go to seed. And then last but not least, uh, biodegradables, like those bags and those utensils that you, that you see that say compostable or biodegradable. Again, our system is not hot enough to decompose those things. And you can do, go ahead and put those in the municipal compost and they'll, they'll be fine in there. And I talked about municipal compost. Do we have any questions so far? I feel like this is, again, a lot to, to put on you. So um, I'm sure you all have some questions. Mm -hmm. There are a few questions that have come through. Um, the first one I might squeeze in with something that came in a bit late about the compost hub. And I think it was from Sherry and she asked, how do we exchange compost when the farmer's market closes? I think that might be related to the seasonality. Is the, does the compost or does the farmer's market close in the winter time? It does. Yeah, mm -hmm. awesome question. We are, our, compo or our farmer's market is going to close for the season November 18th. After that, y'all are welcome to come uh, on our first and third Saturdays of the month. I will send this information out as well, starting, yeah, right after that. I think it's, I don't even know what, what that, for, that third Saturday is. Maybe it's November 21st, I believe. Um, you can start bringing your compost food scraps to our community garden proper um, and they're going to be first and Saturday first and third Saturdays of the month from 10 to 1130 we could probably open that bracket up uh, we do hire ambassadors so if you're interested in becoming an ambassador we are cre I'm creating the description this week <laughs> about uh, how to uh, you know sign up and become an ambassador and you can essentially help us run the compost hub um, and you can help us um, you know which, you know, do the intakes and do the whole process and, and help us out in that way. So there are um, job opportunities as well. Great. So um, uh, there's a couple other that's questions. That's it'll change. Oh, cool. cool. Right on. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so we have another question that says, I have a lot of grass, but no brown material. What should I do? Excellent question. So the way we get our brown material is through uh, seed, our seed, a uh, tree pruning company. So if you kind of just do a quick Google search, tree pruning near me, um, you can call your tree pruning expert and they would be more than happy to drop off a load of mulch for you. You could also start collecting leaves. So get a rake down your street. You know, all, a lot of our trees are deciduous, meaning the leaves fall down during the winter time as they go dormant. Uh, and you can start collecting dry leaves that way. Um, you can also start collecting cardboard from different venues like um, your different uh, warehouses uh, like Home Depot or Safeway. They always have lots of cardboard just to hand out. Just make sure it's without um, color in them. So make sure it's just brown. Uh, uh, that way you're not introducing any toxic chemicals from the paint that can leach into your soil system. Uh, so those are just different ways. There's also, ooh, ooh, oh my gosh. Well, I don't know about this right now, but if you go to a pumpkin patch right now, the day on Halloween or after Halloween, those pumpkin patches want to get rid of their straw bell and they literally give it to you for free. Usually they sell for about 10 to $20 each bale. But if you go there on Halloween right at the end, uh, you can get a ton of straw and each bale is pretty hefty. Um, you could, I don't, I don't I haven't really measured it, but with a bale, since it's so compact, I think we got 14 one year and that lasts the whole season. So if you have a smaller system, maybe like three or four bales and that could last you a while. So that's another option. So this is prime that's time so cool. to get on that. <laughs> I know I'm yeah. very frugal with my, <laughs> I'm like, I've done all the research on this and call all the you know, different spots. So, so there's just so many different ways you can get brown material um, and it's all free. So you don't have to pay. <laughs> Yeah, that's great. Good question. Um, really good question. We have two more questions. Is that okay with you time-wise? Yeah. At this point? Okay. So one is from Richard. Uh, he said, my first pile 
is 1.5 to 2 cubic yards instead of the 1 cubic yard described. Is that okay or should I divide it up? Um, that should be okay as long as it's manageable for you. I mean, you can have a huge, one time we had like a huge compost pile here. It was like in the middle of the garden. It was kind of a weird location and we were managing it. But the thing about the three cubic yards or three cubic feet is that it's a little bit more manageable for you to turn it each week. And we're going to talk about why that's so important in just a minute. But if it, if you can manage it, that's perfectly fine. Um, it's just once it gets to that three cubic feet, it's just like it reaches the optimal temperature. If it's anything smaller than that, it's going to be hard for it to get to that temperature. But after that, it's just, you know, you can make a giant pile and it's just depending on your capacity, uh, whether or not you can get the, the aeration that you need in there for you to turn it and manage it that way. But yeah, that's perfectly fine. Great. Uh, and the last question coming up is from Wei. Um, how do critters get into the tumbler kind of compost bin? They look to be elevated <laughs> from the ground. Great question. Yeah, that is the question of the tumbler. <laughs> so that's the thing, right? All the other systems, it's really easy for those critters that are living in the ground just to kind of climb on up and get into your pile. But with the tumbler, you physically have to put them in there because it's locked and sealed. Um, it's really nice a tumbler just so that you can kind of get the aeration and it's easy for you. You don't have to break your back turning the pile. Um, but I like that um, compost aerator. I would get on that tool. I kind of want that tool. I've never had that tool, but um, that is like a simple tool for, for you to get the air in there as well. Um, but when it comes to those tumblers, uh, that is the trick. You got to put your worms in there. You got to actually find those different critters, the FBI, and actually physically put them in there so they can do your job do the job of, of decomposing. So there's pros and cons to each system really, but that's definitely one of the, I guess, cons to it is that you actually physically have to put them in there and monitor moisture levels. So uh, that's another key ingredient for our compost pile is maintaining that moisture level. When it's elevated like that and it's, you know, it's cooking and stuff, it's harder for it to maintain that moisture level. Similar to like container gardening, you know, when you have your, your, your pot, your, your, your produce and your, your plants in those containers and those pots, you have to kind of monitor the, the watering the, of those a little bit more than if you just had it directly on your soil outside in the garden that way. Um, just because it just dries out a lot faster depending on the, the humidity and you know, the sun exposure and that sort of thing, similar to that. Mm -hmm. Okay, one last question, which I think this is relevant to what we were just talking about. Nikki asked, where do you find the other critters? I've bought earthworms before, but not sure how to introduce the others. Uh, I, <laughs> I, you know, if you build it, they will come. I've never had an issue of, <laughs> of having to like buy. I, I, I don't encourage buying mm. like ladybugs or anything like that because, mm. you know, you're taking them from their natural habitat just to put them into your, you know, kind of urban habitat. Um, so if you build it correctly, they should naturally gravitate to that place. And like I said, we're creating essentially a home for them. We're creating uh, that hotel for them to eat the nitrogen, those green materials, and those brown materials are going to be where they live. So those, that, that layering effect is what causes those critters to kind of gravitate. They know, they, they instinctually, just the way we instinctually know how to eat, they instinctually know where food is and they'll gravitate toward it. I think she might be talking about the for the tumbler, if you have to introduce Ooh. critters into the tumbler. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, if you have a good spot in your backyard, you can kind of dig around that way. Or if your neighbor has a good spot, uh, you can also come to us, and I would be happy <laughs> to give you a bag or like a container of of um, compost with a bunch of critters in them, and you can you can pick them up that way. Or maybe uh, you can go down, you know, to your local park and kind of just grab a pail and if you find a good spot with a lot of roly polies and centipedes and millipedes and spiders, spiders are your friends, you guys, don't kill spiders, they're amazing. <laughs> Just be wary of the black widows, those will hurt you, but, um, and brown recluse. But uh, well, all those guys are, are, are good guys in the garden. So if you're squeamish about those guys, um, they're really essential. They're essential workers, even our insects are. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, cool. There's one more question. Well, I guess maybe we should move on and I might save this question for a bit later just to, to make sure you can get get to your presentation. Sounds good. 
All right. <clears throat> we can continue on. Um, yeah, so we know what materials we want, who's, who's using our materials, how they're breaking them down, what we don't want to introduce in there. So right when, when we're ready and we have our system ready to go, some essential tools that we'll use, right? I should have in included that um, compost aerator in here, but since I don't usually normally use it, that's probably why I didn't include it in here. But to start your compost top pile, um, you essentially want to make sure you have the adequate space, right? And you want that receptacle ready to go, um, as well as having your materials ready as well. Uh, just like a recipe, right? Whenever we're cooking at home, we want to make sure we have all our ingredients um, and the right, you know, tools for us to to, to mix up our ingredients and the right, um, you know, uh, cooking apparatus to be able to cook our stuff, right? So among those are a compost fork or a pitchfork. It makes it really easy to move like bulky and larger items, a shovel or a spade, good for breaking down the materials. It's kind of like the knife um, to cut up our materials. And I'll show you how to do that in just a second. And also it's really easy to kind of move the finished stuff around like the smarter, smaller particles that we want to, we want to move for our finished compost. Uh, also a compost thermometer. So in this picture, you could see a long probe of a, of a thermometer. That guy is, is nice um, just to see where our, how, how our uh, compost is cooking. If you don't have a thermometer, it's not a big deal. You can actually physically just see the steam coming out of your pile and that's how you know it's still cooking. Uh, you can also be observant again uh, by just seeing like the different mycelia that are living in there or the different like mold and things. If you see that white powdery kind of stuff like cooking in there and you see steam, that means it's doing its job, it's working. So uh, a thermometer is nice, uh, but you can easily, you know, buy one online uh, for like 20 bucks. It's not too expensive. Uh, also a sifter. So once your, your compost is pretty much ready to be sifted, you want to sift out those larger materials that haven't quite decomposed uh, completely. So sifting out the, the finished stuff is, is really, really nice. And then last but not least, a wheelbarrow. So this is nice just to move these all these different um, ingredients and these materials around. Uh, you can also soak things. So uh, pro tip, uh, if you have cardboard and it has a lot of tape on it, like a lot of things uh, that are prepackaged do, like your Amazon boxes or whatever, hopefully you're not buying too much. <laughs> but um, you have your, your tape, uh, you soak those in your wheelbarrow or some sort of container, you let it soak. Um, and then it's super easy to peel off those, those, um, those, that tape that way. So that's just a, a little tip that I found to be really easy. Because if you try to tape off, take off that tape when it's dry, it's, it's a lot harder. Um, but that's just super easy. And you're pre-soaking your cardboard. So it's like a nice um, consistency to, to integrate the water into your system as well. And uh, a wheelbarrow is nice because when you're sifting, you can sift your, your finished stuff right into the wheelbarrow uh, before you put your compost to where you want it to go. So those are some essential tools. Next slide. So we know where we're going to put our compost. We know what to put in, what not to put in, what tools we're going to be using. And so let's learn about how we're going to do it, right? Um, so you start by breaking up your materials. The smaller, the better, but don't spend all day out there because you could spend all day out there chopping that stuff up, up. But essentially just, you know, small enough for those guys to start, you know, eating it. If it's super, super large, they'll still eat it, but it's going to take a little bit longer for it to break down. So if you're, you're, you're buying for like a faster compost pile, then you want to break that up from the get-go. Um, because once it starts cooking right, uh, you don't want to be stabbing at those little critters <laughs> and breaking it up that way. We want to do it at the very beginning. Uh, and then we want to um, use a shovel to, to mince up those materials. We also want to integrate those dry leaves and mulch. Um, hopefully, uh, they're also going to be about the right, the right size. Like dry leaves are usually the right size. That mulch, those wood chips are like perfect size for that. But you, if you have like different twigs and sticks at home that you got from maybe like pruning your trees or something, just cut those up with shears or pruners just so that you can get them to, to a manageable size. If it's a twig or a stick that's like super thick, I don't recommend putting that into your pile. 
uh, probably put that in the municipal or the city bin uh, because uh, it's going to take a long time for that to break down. Uh, so yeah, anything that's kind of, I say like, like thicker than your pinky, but every pinky is kind of big, but you know, it's just, you know, maybe they're like, like a quarter inch, maybe it's how wide you want your sticks to be. Anything larger than that is going to take a long time. And it's kind of hard to like get into your pile that way too, because it kind of gets stuck. So just manageable, just thinking like manageability wise, um, try to try to minimize those thicker sticks. And yeah, essentially once we have those ingredients, we're going to create three inch layers uh, with these two ingredients of the greens and the browns uh, within that space. And then we're going to invite air into the pile every week or so by turning it or, you know, using an aerator to get the air in, it, in, in into the compost pile. That's the method that we're going to be using. Uh, next slide. And so you might see that there are, you know, different, you know, issues with your pile. Maybe it's smelly, right? Maybe you, you, you're like, wow, why does it smell so bad? It shouldn't smell this bad. So that means it might be too wet. Um, you just have to add a little bit more of carbon or brown materials to it. And that way it can kind of absorb that excess moisture and it's not introducing too many like flies and, and, and odors that way. If it's too dry, a lot of the times it's too dry, it's not reaching the right temperature. That means you just get to add more, more, more moisture to the pile. So you can add more green material to the, to the pile or even just water. Um, and then turning the pile will also help too. <laughs> Yes, it's a cute little mouse. He's abashed because he, he got into the compost pile. <laughs> so if there's pests in your compost pile, right? Uh, so like rats and raccoons, <laughs> you can uh, turn up the temperature and that should deter the, the pests that way. So if it's too hot for the rats and the raccoons, they're not going to want to get in there. So just turn up the temperature and add, you know, the green material or the brown material or turn it so that you can be uh, monitoring the pile that way. And also, like we talked about before, just don't add things that they want to eat. So if you're putting a lot of like pizza boxes and a lot of like, you know, dry bread and cereals and meat and stuff, they're going to want to get at that. So just don't add that food for them and they won't come. And a lot of the times we find a lot of ants, maybe. Um, and again, uh, maybe it's not at the right temperature. I had this issue before and it just wasn't hot enough. Ants like it a little bit cool and damp, but if it's just hot enough, they won't want to get in there. So you can turn up the temp again, uh, but also cinnamon. They're not fans of cinnamon. And this is if they're in the, your garden as well. If you kind of create like a little cinnamon uh, moat around your plant, uh, the, you know, if you have an aphid problem and that sort of thing, working in a bit of cinnamon into your soil not only helps with the growth of your things, but also with deterring ants as well. And you could put that into your compost pile as well, and that should help. This is a main test that I've seen. I don't know if anybody else has more on that but uh we can we can definitely address that and those are the main things with troubleshooting uh next slide so when once we you know we've turned our pile you know when is it done when is it finished so you know it's finished when your pile kind of slows down meaning it's it's cooking process slows down so the temperature isn't 100 to 150 degrees anymore, maybe it's like 90, 80. So it's kind of returned to like the ambient room temperature or outdoor temperature. That's kind of a sign. You also mainly see like a rich, deep, dark brown color or a chocolate brown or like a dark chocolate. Uh, that is a clear sign that it's, it's, it's getting to its, um, its finished stage. Um, also, you could tell by just what it smells like. So if you grab a handful, uh, you smell it, it's sweet, it's rich, it has an earthy soil smell to it. That's how you know it's, it's pretty much ready to be sifted. So we want to sift the compost to separate the larger material and then let it sit until it cools down again to, to about ambient or room temperature uh, firmly. So I would say about a week or so before you add it to, to be used in your garden. We call it like curating, sort of. You just like let it sit, let it settle, and then you can use it in your garden. Any questions about that? There aren't any questions about knowing when it's done yet, but there are some other questions about the previous stuff. It's okay for me to yeah. bring those up. Mm -hmm. um, so Amelia asks, if you use 
the three stack bins, can worms still get in? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, the three stack bins, <laughs> they'll be on top of the, the foil, hopefully, in your backyard or front yard or wherever you have your compost. Ours is on the side of the house. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, but yeah, they should, you know, they're deep down in the soil and if they find food, they're going to be crawling up there, um, and mm -hmm. they'll find it. Great. Um, and then we ask, what is wrong with ants in the compost or in the garden? Mm. So ants, right? Ants are fine. Don't get me wrong. They're great. They're, they're really important for the garden. It's just, they farm aphids. <laughs> so if you have a lot of ants, and you get aphids, they're going to be farming them. They eat them. Uh, ants are very, very intuitive and very smart and very strong. So they are just really, really smart. And they'll start farming these aphids, and then you'll have an aphid infestation. And aphids just love to eat all of the good vegetables. You know your vegetables are good when you have aphids. <laughs> it's a very common garden issue. Um, but yeah, just kind of mitigating ants is a big thing. That way you, you can kind of avoid the aphids as much as possible. Great. Um, then Nikki asked, should you have a schedule or a cycle for your compost? Like if you consistently add scraps, is there a timeline where you should give it a break to complete the compost process for a finished product mm -hmm. for use? Yes, yes. Um, I generally, once I create that three foot cubed, I don't add anything after. Um, I just let it do its thing. I, I, I turn it, I aerate it. Um, if the pile isn't big enough to begin with, I start adding more stuff, but I tend to, to definitely just create the pile and let it do its thing and not add anything as much as possible. So if that's the case, um, maybe, <laughs> I know I, we have that issue too, where it's like, oh, we have all this new material and then we have to create a new pile. So um, you might have to create another pile if that's the case, if your, your pile's already underway. Um, but if it's, you know, within that first like few weeks, you could definitely add new material and turn it and it'll do its thing. But if it's already been like two or three months and it's almost done, I really don't recommend adding more stuff there. Uh, and yeah, like I said, create a new pile or if you have excess, you know, food waste, uh, join our compost hub and you can just, you know, drop off your donations at our, at our site and then we can take care of it for you. So there's just different ways to, to be able to mitigate that, um, but anyway. And then we had a couple questions about how long it generally takes to complete the composting process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it depends. <laughs> but on, uh, on average, if you are, you know, maintaining it, uh, checking on it every week or biweekly, um, just to make sure it's cooking properly, it takes between three to four months to be completely ready. If you don't, if you don't, if you kind of ignore it, that's fine. You could create your pile and let it sit there for six months, six to nine months, and that's a cold pile. And it'll do its thing. It'll just take a lot long, longer for your compost to be ready. That air, it's, it's, a, it's an aerobic process, the composting. So it's really important to get that air in there to create the friction that we want. And the air also creates the heat that we want to, to, to cook the pile so that it's ready for us at a, at a faster rate after time period. Okay. Um, oh, this is a good one. This is kind of reiterating something we talked about a bit earlier. Francis asked, do you put bio bags in your pile? Good question. We don't. Uh, those biodegradable bags are wonderful, but they, they don't really decompose fast enough for our piles um, to, to be able to, to to decompose it, to, to process it. So they're great for city compost. So hopefully, I, I, I'm pretty sure San Mateo County has compost. <laughs> um, so they have compost bins, right? You have your compost green bin, you have your blue bin, and you have your waste bin. So those kind of things can definitely go into your green compost bin. So if you have biodegradable utensils like forks, knives, spoons, that sort of thing, and those compost bags can definitely go into your city bin because their facilities have a higher <clears throat> higher capacity and higher temperatures to break down those biodegradable utensils and materials. Great. So we're very specific about our garden compost. It's a little mm -hmm. bit more meticulous about what it can accept and what it can't. Mm -hmm. 
let's see. Uh, sorry, uh, Jasmine asked what kind of foods do raccoons like. You touched on that a bit, so maybe if you could just reiterate what kinds of things to avoid to avoid the raccoons. Mm-hmm. Right, right. They love our food. They love anything we eat, essentially. They'll eat everything. They actually, they eat, I remember going on a hiking trip, and I think I had a hiking guide, and they'll eat even banana slugs if they're desperate. Um, what they'll do is they'll wrap the banana slug in, like, a, a bay laurel, and then they'll, like, stuff it down like a taco. It's really crazy. But that's if they're desperate. But since they're, you know, if they live in, like, the city, right, they will eat virtually everything. They're kind of like the goats of the urban world, I feel um, and they'll eat anything. So, um, but they mainly like, like, you know, breads and different like uh, meat products and that like, um, you know, are, so just make sure that your pile is hot enough so that they, they don't want to be attracted to that sort of thing. They will eat your, like your food scraps and stuff like that too. But if you create a pile that, you know, is, is hot enough, anything over like a hundred degrees, they probably won't go near it because it's just like, kind of weird for them I think they just like you know things that are room temperature so as long as you're not introducing that those sort of things they won't they won't go near like any bones or meat products or dairy that sort of thing um or any oils we don't want any oil in there anything greasy really um we're just introducing our our food scraps like our uh, coffee grounds that sort of thing they shouldn't be attracted to that okay great um, Virada asks, what would you suggest for turning up the temp of your pile if you live in a colder area? Mm, yeah. um, I suggest, yeah, I mean, keeping that moisture level, um, making sure that you're checking the temperature is key. But also, um, we have receptacles with lids. Uh, at first, this was an open, open lid system, and Uh, We noticed that, you know, it was reaching the temperatures that we want, but we had a different system where we had a lid on it. And we noticed that with the lid, it actually created, you know, kind of like a greenhouse effect. So put a lid on your on your receptacle. If you are just digging a trench, maybe you can cover it up with a like a tarp of some sort. Maybe use some sort of bricks to kind of hold it down um, taut on top surface level. But uh, a lid tends to kind of help with the humidity and keeping the 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 heat that we want to if you live in a colder colder area and then keeping that right dimension right if it's a smaller pile it's not going to reach that heat that we want and the larger the pile it will reach that heat a lot faster so so um depending on the volume of your of your pile too it'll 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 help with that great um one last question at least what what's come in so far Zang asked, what is the best way of using compost? Should I mix the compost with the regular soil? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You can use it in all sorts of different ways. Um, Generally, a rule of thumb is like one part compost to five parts soil. But, you know, I I tend to use it as like like a top dressing to my garden consistently. So like every two or three weeks, I'll add like a little like a couple inches of, of the finished compost around my, my, my plants. Don't put the compost directly like next to your plant or next to the stem because it could burn the plant. Don't, don't, (laughs) don't do a whole planter bed. That's all compost. You could do that, but there is a chance that you could, um, it could be too much nutrients for your plant and they could burn the the root systems. It could, you know, overload the plant with too much nutrients, kind of like us. If we eat too much salad, that can go bad. (laughs) That can go bad for us too. So um, everything in moderation. So generally it's like a one to five ratio. Let's say you have a container that is, you know, one cubic foot, you want maybe about a fifth of a cubic foot for your, for your, uh, for your compost. So that's the kind of general rule of thumb. But like I said, I sprinkle it in pretty often and it just kind of gives that energy boost to my plants periodically. Great. That's all the questions as of right now. Right on. All right. So, uh, there aren't any more questions, why don't we go outside and make a pile? <laughs> I'm not going to do the whole pile, but I'm going to show you the whole process of, you know, having our materials and then creating the pile and um, showing you different examples of different stages of the pile and different systems that we've talked about right now. Great. Cool. 
All right. Um, so in the meantime, Jessica is going to uh, do a little poll with you as I get set up with my assistant here. Um, and I'm going to turn off my video so that you're, I'm not a distraction while this is happening. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you. OK. So I am just going Ready? to launch a couple. I'm just going to launch a couple of poll questions uh, to keep us occupied as Najiha is setting up outside. Um, one of the questions is about the compost hub that she mentioned, whether you're interested in being a part of it. Um, we're not doing this part of the survey anonymously. So if you answer yes, we'll be able to track that back to you and follow up with more information about how to join the compost hub. So I am launching the polling now. You should see it shortly. And I'll just wait for a couple minutes um, to let to give people a chance to participate and put in their votes. Sometimes it takes a bit for the survey to show up on your screens for some reason, but it should show up shortly. There we can go. You hear me? Great. Yes, we can. Look, I transported into the garden. Okay. <laughs> All right. Welcome, everybody. Um, we're out here. This is our compost system uh, location. It's literally just on the side of the house. Um, and we put it in the shady spot just so that we could kind of mitigate the moisture levels. If it's in a sunnier spot, totally valid, totally fine. You just have to add more moisture more consistently because it will dry up faster. Same principles as the container garden, right? So just wanted to show you a couple of our systems that we have back here. So this one we built through the Office of Sustainability with that, that grant that we got. It's a newer system. It's made out of redwood, so it's beautiful. It looks aesthetically like a little bit more pleasing than the other system that I'm going to show you. But um, we built this lid, like I said, to go with it. We want to kind of show them the piles. We have some piles cooking already. Um, I think that one on the far left uh, is probably ready to be sifted soon. This one here is pretty new. You can see just the mulch on top. It looks a lot brighter and uh, not as decomposed. And then that one on the far right, uh, we added a lot of dry material there. So I have to uh, kind of move that dry material around. So you'll see that too. If you add too much dry material, you can kind of move it around just with different nitrogen stuff, um, little green material so that you can kind of get the right balance. But this is one of the systems that we have going. And then follow me over here. Uh, we have a soil saver as well. One of our gardeners is taking care of this. So essentially it's the same thing. Uh, you create the different layers in here. And then she uses, I think, like a stick just to create the air that she wants in there. And then when it's ready, this is really cool. You have a little chamber here that you can open this little door and then you can kind of scoop out your finished compost that way. So at the very bottom, you'll have your finished material that kind of trickles down. And at the very top, you can add your stuff as it's cooking. But again, um, after about a month or so, you kind of want to stop adding stuff to it. So that's one system. We also have a tumbler that we never use <laughs> because of that same reason where I'm like, I want the animals to be free and be able to go in at their leisure. So same thing, this is like one tumbler you can use and it has a chamber in here and you can put all your, your greens and browns in here and then you can put your critters in there and then um, you can tumble it that way and get the air in that way. There's different air pockets here to do it. So that's another example. Like I said, we don't really use it since we have these other systems. And then this system over here, you can show them, is our pallet board system. So if you want to be frugal, um, like we were at the very beginning, uh, we essentially just took free pallet boards that I got down the street from a fire extinguisher shop. So I just make friends with lots of community members. I mean, I know it's COVID, but uh, you could definitely call them and be like, hey, like I'm looking for pallets. Uh, do you all have any free ones? Usually they actually have to pay someone to recycle those for them. So by you calling them and taking those off their hands, they're usually very grateful for you to do that. That way they're saving money, they're saving time, and you're saving the environment by upcycling things. Just make sure that it's untreated wood. Make sure, it does, you know, there's nothing that, no, no like, treatments that can leach onto the soil because you don't want to introduce contaminants to the soil also. If you get contaminants in your soil, 
I would scrap that and start from scratch <laughs> if you do. So that's one little thing. So yeah, so pallet boards. Essentially, we just used hinges and we just uh, tethered them, uh, you know, using different squares here. So it's super easy. Uh, and then you just create, you know, different backings. You can create a three bin system. You can create a one bin system. One bin system, you just need three. Um, two bin system, you would need five and then a three bin system or more seven and then exponentially growing that way right so it's super easy super economical and then hardware hardware cloth just stapled to the side so you can uh contain your materials that way so like larissa is showing us uh we started this this pile last thursday so you could see there's little fruit flies and stuff that's totally normal it's not a bad thing uh seeing different critters in there is actually a really good thing that means your pile is actually working right so you can see the different layerings already. We have our brown material. Make sure at the very end, your brown material is the last ingredient that you put in. If you leave it with all those greens on top, that will definitely introduce different critters um, a lot faster and you'll probably get rodents that way. So that's one way to mitigate also, is just to make sure you have a good layer of browns at the very end. Um, and then uh, as you can see, the, kinda, the pile is already kind of decomposing and it'll shrink, your pile will shrink. So as it's working, uh, the critters in there are doing their job, and then it'll start shrinking. Your pile will start shrinking. So I think this pile has already shrunk maybe about half a foot since we did it on Thursday. So there's one example. Another example, if you want to come a little closer. <clears throat> this is our halfway cooked pile. So you can literally see, I think, the color difference here. We started this maybe three weeks ago, three or four weeks ago, and you could see it already kind of creating that chocolatey brown color. I could feel the heat from here. I don't even have to put the thermometer in, but I can literally feel it still cooking. Here's a thermometer. So it's a long probe, right? It has a dial, it has a gauge. Um, this, this one is a Rio temp compost thermometer. Um, so I'm gonna just stick it right in the middle. That's the hottest point of the pile is right in the middle. Give it a nice push in there. I'm gonna wait maybe like 10 seconds. And then right away, the dial is going up and up and up and up. It's already at 100 degrees. It's active. It's pretty steady. If it gets really hot, maybe you're really good at this, and you get up to like 200 degrees, that is too hot. You got to cool it down. <laughs> so either you add more brown materials or you, you know, you kind of mitigate the moisture levels that way, making sure it's aerated. But um, so, yeah, you don't want it too hot either because that also, um, you know, just like us, we like different environments, different temperatures. Uh, so do critters, right? Yeah. So the critters are not going to want anything over 150 degrees. After that, it's like, oh, it's too hot for them. They, they, they won't live in there anymore. So that's that. So I'm looking at the dial right now. It's at 130 degrees. That is a perfect pile. I could smell it too. It smells really sweet already. And that's after about a month of, of doing its thing. And we just turned this pile on Thursday as well. So this is a new pile. This is a turned pile. And then I'm going to show you all a new pile. So I saved some of the buckets from the compost tub after we gathered. I set some aside so we can actually create, um, not the full pile because that would take a while, but I'm going to show you just have to, how to create the layers that we want. So I have my shovel here. I got my spade. I got my compost fork, which I might use, I might not. I have my sifter, but I probably won't use that since the pile is new, right? And then we have these different receptacles, but you know, at my house, I literally have a $1 like little plastic trash can. That's my uh, compost saver in my, in my kitchen. But you know, for our program, for the compost hub, if you join the compost hub, this is the bucket that we use. I think it's, um, it's like half a five gallon. So it's maybe two, and actually it's a three gallon bucket to be exact. Uh, we also, uh, you know, have this label on there. So yeah, like things we want, things we don't want, just to kind of remind folks, but you open it and look at that. Let's come a little closer. These are the materials that we want. You see, you got, we got different food scraps. There's a little bit of onion there, but it's mainly just like greens and banana peels. And I see a thicker in there already. If I see it, I'll pick it. If not, no worries. It's really easy to pick it out later on. So I'll pick it out if I see it, but if not, I'm just gonna take this. Woo, that's messy. So if it's sludgy like that, that's okay. <laughs> It'll still, still do the job, but that's why we wanna get this, the fresh material in there as soon as possible. 
so that it doesn't become very sludgy. But, you know, it still works. It's not, not a big deal. But the sludgier it gets, the stinkier it gets, and we just want to avoid that. We clean these buckets every week, so we'll clean that at the end. But generally, for my layering, I'll do like maybe three of these buckets. So that one's a little bit better. Lots of different things. We got mainly just different stocks, um, eggshells and peels and that sort of thing. It's not very pretty at first, but it gets prettier as we go on. <laughs> I'm very happy with these because I don't see any plastic in here. Uh, oh, look at this. We have a, a coffee ground. It's paper though, see? So as long as it's paper, that is perfectly fine. If it's like a plastic thing, I wouldn't want that in there, but it's paper, so we're good to go. This one has, uh, if you're a juicer, if y'all have juicers, pulp is excellent. I'm gonna dump it. Yeah, so if it's larger pieces, all I'm gonna do is mince it up. So we're chopping up our ingredients. So I'll probably just do one layer. I only saved three buckets. Maybe I should have saved more to show y'all. So you'll get a workout. <laughs> I was kind of cold at first, but now that I'm moving around, I'm getting a workout. What's nice is that during the rain, right? That's another reason why we added the lid is because we don't want to make these piles too wet. So when you put your lid on there, you're actually helping with the moisture levels that way as well. Not only with like heat and temperature, but also making sure you're not getting too much water in there as well. So I'm just chopping up my materials. And like I said, I can be out here all day making this salad. Yeah. You can have your kids help you. <laughs> you can take turns. You can get your neighbors involved. I leave the tomatoes in there. I don't mind volunteer tomatoes in my compost. People sometimes do. Um, I don't really mind. I got a weed anyway. It's like, do I want this volunteer? Maybe, maybe not. Cut up my apples. One thing that I saw at the compost hub is a lot of people will throw away perfectly edible things. So I'm kind of mitigating the program and letting people know, hey, like this is still edible. You could just cut off this bad little piece here and you can eat still the rest of this. Also, when it comes to root vegetables, you can eat the whole vegetable usually, like beets, right? The tops of beets, you can eat the stalk, you can eat the leaf, you can eat the whole beet. Same with carrots, you can eat the carrot tops. I like to make like a chimichurri with the carrot tops. Really yummy. Can you all still hear me? Yes, we can hear you. We're just okay, great. wrapped. <laughs> it was a little it was a little quiet. I was like, oh my God, am I just talking to myself? No, no, totally we're here. Fine too. I do it all the time. <laughs> so we're cutting it up. See that? So yeah, I can keep doing this all day, really. But, you know, once I feel like it's a good, a good layer, I'll stop. All right, and then I'm going to get my brown material. Like I said, I just call, I'm really good friends with, um, with a tree pruning company. His name is Juan. I actually don't know. It's called McCallahan, McCallahan tree, tree pruning company. Um, but you know, you can just call your local tree pruner and they'll send you some amazing mulch. Tell them specifically that you want it for, for community composting or for uh, mulching your pathways at a garden. So if you tell them it's for, it's for a garden, they'll be more mindful of like, oh, making sure that it's like good quality wood chips. To, to dump at your site. <clears throat> so I just collected, we get it dumped in the front, but I collected a wheelbarrow of the dry stuff. I'm just gonna grab it, right? And I'm gonna layer it up. It takes some time, but again, this is sort of a labor of love and the results are phenomenal. So it's definitely worth it. So I'm creating my hotel, or I like to call it lasagna, where I give them the food you know, my toppings, and this is the pasta, the dry stuff. Covering it up. <clears throat> I'm 
give it a nice good layer. And these layers are about three inches high, right? So I, I, I would say about, depending on how much is in your bucket or your, your contents, you want like three, two to three, three to four buckets of the brown stuff. There we go. So that's a good layer. And I think I have one more bucket to, oh no, I used them all already. That was it. <laughs> that was the whole, so that is how to create your base layers. And then essentially all you do is keep adding layers and layers and layers until you get to this size here. And that's how you create your pile. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's the full demonstration. Um, of how to do this really. And uh, like I said, you just want to make sure that you're monitoring for the moisture levels. Uh, you are checking for, you know, different pests and that sort of thing. But ultimately, once you get your layers in there, um, it's just a matter of turning it and then watching it and making sure that it's ready and sweet. And once it is, you use this guy here. This is essentially, I built this with like two by four, just scrap wood. I was looking at these online and they're kind of expensive. I saw these for like $80. I'm like, yo, you can make this in like 20 minutes for like free. <laughs> I don't know what these guys, I mean, should I start building this stuff and selling it? I'm not going to do that, but, <laughs> but it's super simple. You just cut your, you know, two by four, make sure you got, you know, two ends that are the same size, two ends on that side. And then you just basically uh, use finishing nails or a staple gun. And then you just put your hardware cloth around it and then you just staple it and that's your sister super simple we also have like a fishing table uh, this is a little bit fancier for like a large system if you just want to turn it that way but this guy it's like a sifting table and um so we have it over our finished compost i wonder if we have any i could show oh here we go so this is the finished stuff so it's curating pretty much done though so once you're done oh and you'll get some volunteers like this is probably like some sort of squash that's how you know it's good when it's already growing stuff so you can see like the wood chips have done their thing but i'm taking a handful and it just smells sweet and earthy and you'll see tiny bits of wood chips uh and that's totally fine that stuff will just stay on top of your bed and then the other stuff will just trickle down and you know put the nutrients back into the plants like you want but essentially, it's just like dark chocolate brown color. I call it black gold because it takes three months to make. So, and it smells amazing. And people are like, oh, there's critters in there. You want critters in there. See, I see a little millipede right now. If you see worms in there, that's a good sign. Don't think that's a bad sign. We want all of those guys in there because they're going to help even in your planter beds as well. So that's, that's what it'll look like. Um, ooh, there's another guy. I try to find the worms in there. Sometimes the worms are just really deep. Yeah, I'm not finding any. Oh, see roly polies. Well, sometimes we find these huge worms. And I'm just like, dang. Hmm. Okay, I don't find any worms right now, but smells really good and I see other critters in there so that's a good sign to me so that's pretty much it do we have any questions we do we do have a couple questions and I just say as I'm asking these questions if anyone who's uh, tuning in right now has anything else you'd like to see just type that into the questions too so that we can make the most of this time outside um, Mm -hmm. But the first question here is from Nikki. Uh, seems like the tumbler composter is a very hands-off approach, and there isn't much cultivating the pile as you are doing now. Is there a benefit to the tumbler, or is it something that is not necessarily the best option for use? Yeah, so we talked a little bit about the tumbler. Um, yeah, you're right. It is more hands-off approach. It's more. I think it's more like a smaller approach too. It's not as large of a system. Um, and yeah, you're not. You're not in it as much I think I get really dirty when I'm making these piles um so that's you know there's kind of the pros and cons uh, pros and cons to each kind of system but that's that's the thing with the tumbler is that you're kind of like just really tumbling it and I don't know if I were a bug and I was in there and I was getting tossed around like that I would kind of freak out <laughs> I don't know but that's just me that's like my intuition 
So tumblers, I think, as uh, like if you're squeamish, right? I actually have a lot, uh, a couple gardeners that are in the uh, the nutrition class, and she's like, I want some seeds, and I want to start my garden, but I'm terrified of worms, and I'm like. <laughs> you're gonna have you're gonna have to get over that kind of fear because worms one they they're not gonna hurt you and two they're super essential so if you are gonna do a tumbler and you're kind of squeamish with the insects it might be a good option for you um, and then essentially you'll you'll you know open the chamber and get your castings that way but uh, it really just depends on what you want and what your space is like we have a lot of space so we create this huge system but if you don't have all the space a tumbler is a great option and is not as messy. <laughs> Awesome. Um, this next question is something that's come up almost every home composting workshop we've done. So I think it's good to touch on. Um, the question is, will stirring disturb the layers that you built up? Because there's a thing how we want to have layers and then we're stirring up the layers. So it can seem right. counterintuitive. Right, right, right. So yeah, yeah. There, I mean, it's okay. But once you get those layers in there, right? Um, you know, it's doing its job, they're working, you know, and those layers start decomposing. So they're, you know, it, it, it all kind of just mixes together. It's kind of like when we, when we cook our, uh, our muffins, right? We got our, our ingredients and they're cooking up, but ultimately the product as it's happening, as it's cooking in its oven, it's going to want to emulsify and it's going to want to kind of stick together. And that's okay. Those critters in there are just kind of getting that process started. And when we turn it, be gentle with your turning. Don't like jab it and like fling it around. I kind of try to do like a, like a good, I'll show a demonstration of that. So I'm going to be turning this pile. Let's say I just want to add it to this pile. Uh, sometimes I mix the piles. So like it depends, like that pile over there, like I said, it was a little bit too much brown. So I started using those browns in this pile actually, just to kind of work with that. But I want to go in and disturb it as, as little as possible, but I'll just take it. And I kind of just place it right on top. Disturb it as, as little as possible. But again, this is just part of the process. It's okay uh, for there to be, um, you know, a mix of those layers. That's totally fine. It doesn't have to be perfect. Obviously, it's never going to be perfect. So that's okay. Just trying to be gentle with it. <laughs> that's the goal. Yeah. But yeah, just coming in. Uh, ergonomics, right? We want to preserve our backs. We don't want to twist our backs. This is one thing that I tell all the volunteers. You want to go in maybe at the very top here and then just slowly take that extra step and put your foot down. So you're not twisting your back. I don't want to see this motion. This will completely destroy your back. So I just want to go in, make sure I have a good hold, come out, use my extra foot, and just put it on in. And that's pretty much it. I just do that, repeat that process. Do a tag team, although I had a volunteer on Thursday. She did the whole tile by herself. I was really impressed because that's a lot of work. And she wasn't even breaking a sweat, so I don't know how that happened. But, <laughs> but she did it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is, this has impressed. been so good. Thank you for doing all of this. Does We don't have any other questions that are open. I just want to give an opportunity. Does anyone else who's attending have anything else they want to see before we transition back inside? If you do, just you could type it quickly into the Q&A and we can accommodate that. Or if you have any other last questions about this piece. <laughs> Someone says, thank you for holding the laptop to show us. Oh. <laughs> Thanks, Larissa. Yeah, my pleasure. <laughs> this is my first time doing this sort of thing. So I have my camera crew here. Larissa, should I pan to you? You want to say hi? <laughs> no? Okay. She's okay. a little shy. But, um, but without her, I wouldn't be able to do this. So it's a lot of yeah. fun. It is so cool. I feel like we're there with you. I wish we were. It looks beautiful there. Your garden is so yeah. beautiful. Do you want to show them the garden? Yeah. yeah. So I'm trying to just turn slowly. So we got apple trees over here growing, you know, once it gets kind of, you know, they're deciduous. So they'll leave. With, do you guys want a tour of the garden? <laughs> we could do it, it might be hard. We could, we could. It's kind of hard to walk with the no. laptop and keep it steady, I feel like. Yeah. But Bonnie yeah, did say it. that she would like a tour of the garden. So did Sherry. So Cool. Yeah. People are, are expressing Maybe interest. Maybe just like a, a, a wide right. shot and people get like a glimpse of what the, they can come. Uh, so I was telling the volunteers this. If you volunteer with us, you know, you're welcome to come. Like uh, those first and third Saturday starting uh, November 7th. Uh, and hang out in the garden you just have to sign up with us since we have like a, a safety protocol because of covid but um 
Y'all are welcome. I know that winter is coming. It's going to be, I think, a pretty tough one for folks since we have to be inside most of the time. We can't go to different venues like we used to during the winter. So if y'all just want a space to just hang out in a garden, uh, just hit me up and I can, you know, let you guys in and you can have, you know, we have different picnic areas. Um, if you just want to sit, meditate, just kind of cool off. We also have a hammock under the oak trees. If you just want to kind of meditate and walk around in the garden, if you want to volunteer, you're more than welcome to. Um, just, you know, contact me and I can set you up on how, different ways to do that. We also have a greenhouse um, set up over there. I love to be in there when it's raining. It's like a rainforest. I feel very, like, warm in there. It's nice and cozy. <clears throat> and then all of these spots that you see, they got different numbers on them. Uh, these are assigned spaces for folks that don't have space at home. They don't even have balcony spaces. So right next door, we have an apartment building and they, they have windows but no balconies. So this is just a good space for them community members to have a space to come um, commune and uh, do their communal gardening. Um, we have smaller spaces for like the newer people or people that just want a smaller space and then our, along the parameters sort of like our urban farmer incubator where we give them like larger plots and they can grow a lot more and they usually share a lot of their produce with the rest of the community. Um, and in the front we have our instructional garden um, and our volunteer garden, which is like a hodgepodge of different things. And usually what we would do is have our workshop and then apply a lot of what we learn and do it in the front. And then we just got this really cool native garden as well in the front. So if you guys want, just hit me up and I would be more than happy to give you a tour um, of the space. It's so gorgeous. Are those marigolds? That is, yeah, those are giant marigolds. <laughs> They're beautiful. I didn't think they were going to be so big. Uh, Julie, she usually does like tomatoes, um, and they, the marigolds kind of just took over. Uh, Julie has two spots, though, so she wasn't too sad about that. But, uh, but yeah, those giants. She grew those from seed, too, in the greenhouse. Um, wow. So I think we'll do that, too. We'll start up some seedlings. Um, and if you all want seeds or seedlings, you know, you can definitely use this as a resource for that. We also have tools that you can buy as well. Loris is like way awesome. in there. I'm not going to go way out yeah. there. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like you're. It seems like you're with us because your audio is still very. I know. Clear. <laughs> I know. I'm like just kind of your your narrator here in this documentary. But, yeah. um, <laughs> great. This is so great. Thank you for sharing that, Loris. It's really nice to see. Kind of like yeah, a sound absolutely. on this Saturday morning. Yeah. Um, yeah. Should we? I guess we could just actually reconvene. wrap it up out here. We don't need to go back inside, right? Yeah. It's a lot I quicker think. than what I thought. I guess it was supposed to be up until 12, but. I think that's okay. I mean, all. I think what we can maybe do um, if you're up for it is I'll just, I have a little survey to just like gather satisfaction from people. And then we could mm -hmm. have one last thing where if people have any lingering questions, we can just have some Q&A to make sure people feel ready to go. Is that okay? Sure. Sure. Okay, so I'm going to launch that poll right now to just get some feedback about the workshop, and then we'll just answer any last questions you have if you're still feeling unsure about something. But are you okay to just stick out there in a jihad? I think it's kind of beautiful. Yeah. Larissa, do you want to put the laptop, like, here, and you don't have to hold it? They're going to do, like, yeah. a quick poll, and then, um, <clears throat> and then any lingering questions you can have at the end. But we're pretty much wrapped mm -hmm. up here. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to launch yeah, the poll it. now. You should see it come up on your screen. It, it sometimes, like I said, takes a, a few minutes for whatever reason to come up on the people who's attending, who are attending screens. Um, but you should see it shortly, and we'd really appreciate it if you could give feedback just so we can continue to improve and see what you liked and didn't. I don't want to like, sometimes I go out in the hammock and I work out there and I get really distracted. <laughs> but I kind of like this spot too. I can bring a chair out here and just work outside. Probably that looks very it. beautiful. No. <laughs> Mm 
Mm, it smells nice. Yeah. It smells like autumn. <laughs> I was just telling her that. I was like, I know when the season changes by the smell. It's really weird. <laughs> yeah, that's good. I think I just have a good sense of smell too. It's like I just, and then it's like the like kind of like the humidity in the air too yeah. kind of shifts. Yeah, like today when I woke up yesterday, I think when we went out, it was just like okay, we changed finally. You like you feel it too. Yeah. It's like intuition too. Okay, I think we have most people Here's participating, so I'm gonna end the poll. All right, <clears throat> and then we have a. Uh, just one question so far, but again, if you have other things, feel free to send them in now and we'll just kind of uh, address them as long as people have questions. So the first from Birita is, are there any resources for DIY garden building for beginners? Compost bins, planter boxes, where to get supplies, et cetera. Mm, yeah. Uh, <laughs> when I was first started before we got like budgets for like different projects I would definitely just look online and pick up different sources online through like Nextdoor or Craigslist um, that sort of thing it's just like tapping into like community you know members that sort of thing um, <clears throat> but you can also you know you could just call around I mean, I think that's what I did, and it's like an easy way to do that, and sometimes they just leave their stuff, like, in front of their house, and you can come pick it up. I had a lady um, tell me that she had some blueberry bushes that she didn't want anymore, and she literally just emailed me and was like, oh, come pick them up, and she had them in front, and I just kind of picked them up with the truck. Um, we are also a good resource, so we always have, like, spare lumber and wood and stuff, um, and then I think we're going to create, like, we've, we've gone for by, uh, virtual, right? So we're going to create, we already have some videos like on cooking and gardening, but definitely I think DUI, do it yourself, yeah. DIY is definitely something else we can do too. I think we actually started talking about that as like a live workshop um, before COVID. Um, but, you know, I would be more than happy to show people how to create their own planter boxes. There are resources like YouTube. I think that's how I learned. I literally just YouTubed it. Uh, a lot of what I know is through YouTube um, and experimenting uh, in my own garden. So every garden, right, has its own microclimate. So you have to kind of just go out there and observe. A lot of gardening is just pure observation and intuition, really, um, and then doing your own research. That's really what it is and experimenting. Believe me, I have been doing this for six years and I still kill plants. So don't feel bad if you kill your plants. <laughs> it's just all part of the process. Um, and it's just natural for it to happen. So don't feel discouraged if this is your for like first composting or your first garden. Um, we all make mistakes and it's totally okay. Mm -hmm. I'll also note that we do have this edible home gardening sort of community that we're building up and we're having one meeting per season. And that community is really intended for people who are maybe newly gardening at home or even if you have a lot of experience to come together and share we usually have a little lecture and then we have some group discussion where people can share ideas and ask questions. So that can be a really good resource too. And we should, mm -hmm. um, we have a upcoming newsletter that we'll send out in maybe a week and a half about upcoming sustainability Academy events. And that workshop will be in that newsletter. So you'll all be on the mailing list for the newsletter. So you'll all see it. And if you're interested, um, we'd love to have you there too. Um, so there's another question about whether it's okay to compost leaves that have been affected with peach leaf curl. I don't know what that is. But peach leaf curl. Yeah, it's like a disease within the, within the trees, usually in like the, the stone fruit. Um, I wouldn't, I would definitely discard those leaves in like the municipal compost so that it doesn't get into your compost. So yeah, no diseased plants or leaves in your compost as much as possible. Like early leaf blot, that sort of thing. You just don't want that in your system because um, it'll just perpetuate it in the future. Okay. And if you do have that issue, definitely take those leaves off <laughs> to prevent it from spreading onto your tree. Um, yeah. Um, there is a question about worms about Wrigley worms <laughs> for the Wrigley Ranch I suppose um, mm -hmm. are you okay to answer one of those 
just about worm Maybe. health. <laughs> okay, we'll see. Sure. If, if not, there we are um, alternating hot pile composting workshops, which was the topic of this workshop in worm composting. So we will have a dedicated worm composting workshop coming up for people who are interested in that. But um, Winnie did ask that there's a little bit of white on some of the worms in her worm bin and whether that's a cause for concern or not. Right. Or you, do you know? I don't mm -hmm. know what that is. Okay. Or, or maybe white, small white, white like, worms, like pot worms or something. Oh. I think that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not sure, honestly. I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a vermicomposting expert. I'll tell you that much. Yeah. Well, then I suppose we could say... You would tune in for our upcoming vermicomposting workshop. I, yeah, we'd have a whole yeah. we'd have a whole discussion about that. Yeah, um, I think they're okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I think those are all the questions. Unless anyone else has something burning, I think we had a lot of great questions. So thanks for being so amenable to answering all of them, Najia, and thanks everyone for being so participatory and coming with your questions. Mm -hmm. And Ivana made a good point. Sorry, I neglected to mention that there are a lot of worm composting resources on the Office of Sustainability website mm -hmm. as well, which we will send out as a kind of follow up to this workshop so that you can access that. Yeah. And that do do it yourself. Um, you know, definitely hit up Office of Sustainability for like different. Like I think there's like a rebate for like two hundred dollars or something if you build your own uh, system. So you can probably get you know, a little money for, for building your own systems as well. Yeah. Um, is there anything, any note that you would like to end on, Nadiha? Have fun. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be discouraged. And like I said, just, you know, email me. I should probably leave my email so y'all can ask me more questions. You know, as you start doing it, right, I, I'm a very kinesthetic, like, experimental, like, experiential learner. So as I do it is when my questions will come up. So um, I kind of just gave you an idea of, like, what I've experienced, but I'm sure there's a, other different experiences. Um, so let me just put my email. And you all can ask me. Ask me about the compost job. Ask me about this. Awesome. And, uh, Thank you. Thanks to you and yeah. big shout out to Larissa for holding the laptop. It was really cool to see all of that demonstration. Yeah, I'll let her know. She's very much appreciated. She didn't hear a lot of it since all the, the audio is on my end. So she just heard what I was hearing <laughs> or saying, I guess. <laughs> I think you're muted. Oh, sorry. I was saying, I guess that's it. But um, thank you all so much for coming. It's really great. Thanks for coming out on this beautiful fall day. Thank you. Have fun out there. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Hmm. And way asked where the email is. The email is in the chat. So if you're still on here, uh, <laughs> Najiha put her email into the chat button, which you can open by pressing on the chat icon at the bottom of the screen. <laughs>